Hello and welcome to Kushti TV, the straight talking YouTube channel. Yes, today we've got a nice surprise in store for you. We have heard of the Gypsy King Tyson Fury and many people lay claim to be King of the Gypsies. But I can tell you right here, right now, undoubtedly, joining me here today is the very King of the Gypsies. Yes, he is King of the Gypsies, no doubt, for two decades. He is the one and only Mr. Johnny Frank, and welcome to the show, sir. Pleased to meet you. Absolute <laughs> pleasure. Yeah, so um, always a pleasure to see you, sir. And um, you um, were born to parents, Jim Franklin and Janie Ball. Yes. And um, you're the oldest son. Your one sister's the eldest, you're the oldest son, you're so, one of yeah. four. And um, your, your dad, Jim, was a good fighting man, but he was an uninterfering man. He went about his business. He wasn't a man that went out there, really got in trouble. But I was, no, told, he, I was told he could do his bit. Would he had to? You know, he could have a fight if he had to. If he had to, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, um, and he really had to because he had kind, nice manners. That's right, yeah, yes. So, so that's nice and pleasing to hear. So, so tell me, um, from an early age, tell me how you got into boxing, how it all started. My dad took, took us there. We, we was always with the gloves at home, me and my brother Sam sparring and fighting one another. Yeah. And they, he said we'd go to the gym, and he took us to the gym, and that's where it started off. And this is what, Reading Boxing Club, was Red, it? Reading Boxing Club, yeah, Salisbury Club. Salisbury Club, Reading Boxing yeah. Club. And, uh, and uh, there was a fellow called, uh, I've done a bit of research, obviously, I need to, because that's, that's what I, partly what I do. Was a fellow named Ron Bastin, um, was your amateur trainer? That's right, Ron Bastin, yeah. Ron Bastin, yeah. yeah. So, um, you, you had a slow start. Tell me, I'm a bit of intrigued, but you had a slow start in your boxing career. I think you lost something like your first four or five fights. Yeah. And then you went on this amazing, think like seven year or six year unbeaten six year, run. That's what I did, yeah. What was the turnaround from losing the first few fights, four, five, six fights, to then going around with this six year unbeaten run? I just started training harder, that's all. Did you? It was to it. So you lost your, your fights on points earlier, and you just yes. trained a bit harder, and you got Never the knack of winning. No. No. Just, just lost on points, yeah. Yeah. And during your, your career, you went on to win numerous amateur titles, ABA titles, yeah. and you boxed, I think, did you captain England on a couple of yeah, occasions? Yeah, a couple of occasions, yeah. And I was the first boy to win four NABC. National Association Boys Club Championship. Championship. For the yeah. viewers at home, that's the yeah. NABC, as yeah. it was called, yeah. And I should have only had three, it's only for three fights, Yeah. but it ended that I, 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 my age yeah. was low. And I went on to the fourth one. I, For the fourth one. And you're the, the only fighter to date to win four NABC championships. Yeah. So I think what happened there, there was a, a catchment of age because then it sort of got outlawed. You could only win it three times at a certain age. Yeah, yeah. So you had that catchment where you could enter it four and you won it four. Yeah, yeah. And the captain England... For anybody is good, but the good thing about boxing, you've faced a lot of discrimination, lots of gypsies have over the years, but with boxing, it's fair to be said, it was an opportunity given to the rough, tough, needy and underprivileged. So, so there's no barriers put up there. You're captain of England from a gypsy background, yeah. and that's very pleasing from any background, but you must be very proud of that. How many times did you captain England? Oh, only two, a couple of three times. Well, that's good enough. I mean, <laughs> yeah. once wouldn't be too bad, would it? Yeah, well done. So after a glittering boxing career, you met the love of your life, your wife Gertie, and you turned professional in marriage. You set about building a family. Yeah. And you turned professional in 1970. You made your debut. That's right. And um, the career was going swimmingly well. As you're a great amateur, great things were expected of you. And you were winning your fights. You become the British Southern Area Champion. Yeah. And um, But then you had this... <laughs> You had this wild side to you where you loved to drink, a smoke and a gamble. I never stopped drinking and I never stopped smoking. But not a lot to drink. I'll have a pint or I'll have one fag or two fags a day, whatever it is. Sometimes I go a week without even smoking or drinking. It wasn't taking me over. Yeah, yeah, so you weren't you weren't going on big drinking, but no. you, you always had a smoke and a, and a drink. drink yeah. But would sometimes it spill over a little bit more to five or six pints and ten or twelve fags sometimes? Only when I had no money, I'd make them buy me drinks. <laughs> 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 well, that sounds a decent idea. Let me bear that one in mind. <laughs> 
So um, with, with a lack of training, it's widely known, without being disrespectful, it was widely known that you weren't the hardest trainer out there, is that correct? No, I wasn't a, a real hard trainer, but I'd done me a bit of running, which was should have been three mile, five mile, mile. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. Was the main part of it. So a mile, mile a five mile become a mile. Yeah. I, I was once told a story, your dad dropped you off at a certain point and he went in his motor, he said, I'll see you four five miles later and you took a shortcut across the field, is that true? <laughs> That's right, yeah. Yeah, well there you go. So, in the nicest way, you weren't the hardest trainer in the world. No, well, so a few no. defeats come along in your professional career at this time. You lost to Pat McCann, it was a big awkward tall southpaw. Yeah. You lost a couple of other fights, and it was looking like all that hype that was predicted was going to fall to the wayside. But a title chance come, John Conti become the world champion, and the British title then was vacated. The brilliant Chris Finnegan become the challenger um, for the vacated title, but there was a fight off an eliminator with a fellow called Phil Matthews who was who had offered the title eliminator to face Chris Finnegan, a formidable task in itself, an Olympic gold medalist, a great fighter, we all knew that. And you, had, but many people were avoiding Phil Matthews like the plague. He had a wicked, devastating punch, yeah. yeah. And people were avoiding him, but you bravely took him on because you're a fighting man. That's what you do. You took him on in Mayfair in, in the West End of London, and tell us um, during my research, he hit you so hard in the first round. Apparently, you went all around the ring. Explain what happened. Is that true? Twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's what. <wild. laughs> But he did, he did hit me and knock me down. I, I fell flat on my face. Yeah. But I did get up at the time and I did outbox him, outpunch him and won the fight. And then you were, then, so that then takes us on to your title fight with Chris Finnegan. And you were standing in a gypsy camp, you're from Reading, um, Berkshire, but you were standing in a gypsy camp in West London, just west of London, a place called Hampton, yeah. Bishop's Grove. That's and um, one of your mates was banging you early in the morning, making sure you're doing your road work got you ready for the 15 right, three minute yeah. rounds. So for the viewers at home, 15 three minute rounds in them days, you had to endure. So you're an hour in the ring, but including your rest, you're in there one hour fighting. So a long time and you have to be right on key. So a bloke by the name of Mark Hilden was giving you a knock up early in the morning, right, getting yeah. you ready. And you went on to have this British title fight at the Royal Albert Hall, which become fight of the year. It was an absolute thriller. Tell us the feeling after all the hard work you've endured, starting from a little boy, when Harry Gibbs went and raised your hand to be the British light heavyweight champion. Well, it's the best thing I ever had done to me, really. Yeah. But I did fight well and I did beat him. It wasn't a bad fight. It was a real good fight. And uh, we punched each other to death, really. <laughs> the greatest thing ever happened to me, wasn't it? Fighting yeah. for a title and winning it. And yeah. It, w it was a close fight. And the second fight, I think, was even closer. Yeah, but I did beat him, and that and was it. So you you now, you now lay claim that Britain, the gypsy, English Roman gypsies had a British champion. And let me get this right at home: British champions of the day are serious, serious fighters. They don't give them away. But with the one weight division, they were much harder to win. With all due respect, they were much harder to win. And what come with it was celebrity status. That's right. You 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 done things like open up shops and turned up at fates and yeah, things like that, this. Yeah. You got real celebrity status. Almost you could almost get an accolade that a, a world champion could get of today. That's the sort of um, celebrity status yeah. you got. Was that correct? Well, I, I used to go and open up shops and clubs and bits and pieces. How did that feel? Was that? Was that yeah, a bit? Well, it was nice to go in front of people like them and then yeah. they announcing my name and all this and that and he's opening the gym and opening the shop or whatever. Lovely, yeah. I bet it was time of your life. So just to um, touch on how good Chris Finnegan was, the man that you lifted the title from, you was number five in the world, yeah, at your best. And again, I don't want to keep going on about it, but for the viewer at home, there was no four weights. Well, there, there, there was one champion for one weight. So there was no, like, potentially five titles of WBA, WBC, W, uh, BO, and so on, yeah? So IBF. So there was one title for one weight. And Chris Finnegan fought the greatest light heavyweight ever, Bob Foster. Nobody could beat him, and that was a great fight when 14 rounds. Fight, yeah. fight of the year again. And Bob Foster had to go up and fight 
Muhammad Ali, because nobody could touch him at light heavy. And I think he put a good account of himself for about nine rounds. So I'm not putting you quite, I'm not putting you and Chris up with Muhammad Ali, but you're not a million miles away when people are mixing it, the people are mixing it with. That's how good a champions they were. Touch yeah. me, they were sort of knocking around the door of Muhammad Ali. Talking about the great man Muhammad Ali. Now, it must have been. Now, we've got to wait for this at home, because this, uh, this is a bit special. You went on tour, boxing exhibitions all around England and Europe yeah, with Muhammad yeah, Ali. Yeah, yeah. What sort of person was he? The most person I've ever met in my life. Really? He called me the Gypsy Boy. Really, did he? Yeah. yeah. I beat the Gypsy Boy in all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he, he let me do what I wanted to do. He was a lovely man. He was, yeah. And on one of the fights, I've, I don't know if it was in England or abroad, but on, one, on your tour, on an exhibition fight, we got this, have a look at this fantastic picture. It's the great man Ali on the floor, not you. So we, we, Ali was such a character, we don't know if you've chinned him good, clean and square, or he's maybe gone on the floor, but... But he looked hurt, didn't he? He looked, <laughs> <laughs> he looked good. <laughs> so they were great times, and, and yeah. when they say he got the name of the greatest, he was a great person. Greatest, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's nice to hear, because that's a picture people drew up of him. I'm going to make one comparison here, because there's many comparisons. Um, King of the Gypsies sitting right beside me, the Gypsy King, you didn't quite get out of the way of it. Now I'm going to show both recoveries. You can see the one of Tyson Fury, just about making it, and yours. Look at this for a right hand. Now at this stage you look completely out and finished, but somehow or another, just like the Gypsy King, yeah. the King of the Gypsy, the Gypsy Clown Johnny Frankham, pulls himself off the floor, and don't only pull yourself off the floor, you then go on and a dis brilliant display of boxing to beat the American out of sight. What does it take to get off of that floor when you've been it so hard? I haven't had the opportunity to ask Tyson Fury, he said it a bit publicly, tell me what it takes when you've been it so hard to go down like that, head first, what? face first and get back up. You're a bit dizzy and you don't know what, <laughs> <laughs> what makes you get up really. Instinct, is it? Instinct, isn't it? Yeah. It's just born in you. It's just something you've got. Up, yeah. Because yeah. fighters do quit when they're hurt sometimes, they do, don't they? Yeah, but you yeah. ain't got that in you. So no. there's a natural born warrior instinct. You don't know how to quit. That's it. Is that that's, fair to say? That's good to say. Yeah. So you you had, you had a skill set to die for. Um, I once spoke to Chris Finnegan, the man you took the British title for, and lost it back to in two great fights. They were a bit like this, and you won one rightfully so, and he. You, you actually, a lot of people thought you fought better in the second fight. But um, moving on from that, Chris Finnegan had said to me once, he said, to hit Johnny Franklin was nearly impossible. He said he was like an eel. He said he was everywhere. You just couldn't catch it. But how do you think you would have done against people like Roy Shaw, Lenny McLean, and other, and other gypsy knuckle fighters who had basic knuckle fighting skills? How do you think you would have done that? Because you've won all your fights outside decisively, the ones you've had. You've beaten, you, you, you know, you've done all that decisively. But tell me how you would have done with Lenny McLean, Roy Shaw, and other knuckle fight travellers alike in your prime. Well, I, I would have beat them, beat the lot. <laughs> yeah, <that's good> <laughs> I've, had, I've had quite a few fights outside, and and how have you done? Not too badly, I'm told. <laughs> I've won the lot. Good boy. Well, that's why I think you're called the Gypsy King, isn't it? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, look. Everybody got an opinion at home, yeah? I agree with you. Yeah. You know, all due respect, Roy Shaw's a mate of mine. I didn't know Lenny. They were good fighters. But all I, good I, fighters, I yeah. agree with you. They were tough hard men, but it takes a bit more than bravery alone. You've shown the bravery. We've got that on footage. But the skill set is something you can't give an advantage away. And, um, yeah, I agree. I'm agreeing with you. And why wouldn't I? He's a bit near me. You see, he's a little bit, and people do come out of retirement sometimes. But I've got to say the right things, and he's sitting right next to me. <laughs> <laughs> your dad's one of your dad's best mates was Jack Daly, my grandfather. Your grandfather, yeah. Yeah. What influence as a little boy? He was a formidable fighter, fighting around the country, always in headlines before television. What effect did he have on you? Was it was it somebody you you admired and inspired you? I did admire him. I used to. Go with him. He, he he was the nice nicest man you'd meet. He was a real nice man, and but it, in his day, he was a very good man. Yeah. But as the years grow out, as we always do, we linger on and yeah. Well, I mean, not, you not, don't not, you, not so good. You don't hang around forever yeah. in that game. It's yeah. it's a young man's game. So that's, but he, that's he had the best name among travellers. 
Of his time. Yeah, yeah, of his time, yeah. Well, they, these are nice words for me, because Jack Daly's born Aaron Smith. His ring name was Jack Daly, he's my grandfather. So that makes me very proud, and he was your dad's best mate. Yeah, um, yeah there's a wonderful story how we become best mates. Uh, your dad was about to get sat upon by a few other That's fellow right. Romanies, and, and my grandfather come in and uh, leveled things up a bit, and they, they knocked the other fellas out, didn't That's they? And that cemented really a good friendship. Yeah. So, um, good story that. But tell me, so, so Jack Daly had, a, had a, a, an effect on you. You become a celebrity fighter with television. What effect do you think you had on generations moving forward for the likes of Andy Lee, Billy Joe Saunders, and Tyson Fury? Because a lot of travellers, yeah. gypsies, believe you set the tone by being famous and you day. It, it got a lot more people into sport. I, I was the first travelling boy to I win see, a title. Or... To win the title, proper yeah. travelling boy who yeah. come undisclosed. Because a lot of people, previous champions, were in fear. They had such discrimination, they were in fear of coming yeah. forward. But you put your name out there as Johnny Frankham, Gypsy Johnny Gypsy, Frankham. Yeah. Gypsy Johnny Frankham. And that's obviously been a positive for fighters coming forward now, like for Tyson Fury. Andy Lee, Billy Joe Saunders, who are brilliant world champions. So that's been a positive moving forward from what, yeah. Thing. It's been an outfall thing for them, do you yeah. think, what you achieved? Yeah, definitely. Good. Good. Well, they, that's, it's worked for you boys, eh? Hey? Um, Billy Joe Saunders, Andy Lee, and Tyson Fury. Plenty of money out of the game, rightfully so. Well done, boys. Deserved it. Work very hard and take the knocks and bruises along the way. But with thanks to the yeah. original champ going back some. Tell me something, you met the greatest Muhammad Ali, you boxed him in an exhibition, you went on tour, you loved him as a brilliant person. He is one of the all-time greatest fighters ever, arguably. Now there's a modern great by the name of Tyson Fury, yes. Um, and now I'd like to have been, I'd like to have been present, we've got King of the Gypsies going back, and the Gypsy King present. <coughs> You've been out with him on a few occasions. Tell me, what is he like as a person, Tyson Fury? He's a very nice person, talk to you. Real, real nice man. He's a nice man. So you, you don't, you, you and Tyson Fury don't even talk boxing. Not really, no. No, but a nice man. Yeah. And how do you think he, he rates as a modern great? You think he's going to be one of the greatest fighters? He, he is the greatest fighter. He's not will, will be. He is the greatest fighter now. Really? He, he, no, nobody have beat him. Well, I mean, this is coming from a man that's mixed with Muhammad Ali and been around with him. So I, I, I'm not, I totally agree. I mean, he's, he's, his last fight, he made a good fight that looked second rate, didn't he? Yeah. He's just bang on. So, But a nice fella as well, more importantly. Yeah, a very nice fella. Oh, well, there you go. You can't ask any more than that. No. So he's, he's raising the gypsy flag quite well then, hasn't he? He's got very, it right up there good. and out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You win a nice chunk of money, you come home, you buy some land with it, yeah? That's right, yeah. In, in the In the Red, in Wokenham area, Wokenham, yeah? Wokenham, yeah. And then some three decades or so moves on, 30 years or so moves on, and a property developer phones you and says, right, we want to develop your land for an housing estate. That's yeah? right, yeah. So now, suddenly, all the gambling, the ups and downs, and the roller coaster ride, you've now got lots of money, yeah? <laughs> so... A little bit of money. A little bit. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, so so you, you you you've done well. You've got a beautiful home. I've had the pleasure to be, and um, you know, due to the uh, development and all yeah. that, so things are going well. And sadly, a couple of years ago, you lost your beautiful wife. You're obviously broken-hearted, down on one knee. But the champion you are, you're a warrior. You pick yourself up. Yeah. You move on with life as you have to. Got to yeah. Yeah, and you're happy running your sort of small to medium factory estate. You rent your units out and that keeps you going on a daily basis. That's right, that's correct, yeah. And um, things are all happy and unky-dory there. Yeah. But tell me, um, the family Frankham boxing um, 
championship is not you know the champ the, the champion and uh, it's not completely gone yet is it we've got a great opportunity right in front of us in that of your grandson he could easily replicate you as a british champion charles boom boom frankham yeah. and um i watched him fight last time albeit on telly i couldn't make i couldn't make the fight live i thought he boxed superbly well against a good opponent things are looking good tell us about charles what do you think where's he going at i think you go you go the distance uh, uh, any 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 fighter that's yeah same as him like but he's he is really a, a real good fighter. He's champion now of some sort, doesn't he? He's he's been twice European amateur champion. Yeah. And he's now unbeaten as a pro. Yeah. And um, he's looking really good to me. I think he could go all the way. But he's got remnants of your style. He's oh, very yeah. hard to hit, isn't he? Yeah, very hard to hit. And I think he's a very good boy. He, he is a, a real good fighter. And he's a good grandson, more importantly, isn't very, he? Very, very good grandson. Ah, oh, well, that's what that's what we need to hear, I right? Only hits him twice a day. <laughs> <laughs> so, champ, before we sign off, what message we got out there for the fans? What message we got out there for the young boxers wanna be, and the fans? What we're gonna say to them? You can say what you like to someone; they don't take notes. <laughs> Well, you're talking to a fight, I get him to listen to another thing. Box Trevor and keep watching Cushley TV. Ah, well, there you go. What a That's not a bad little sign-off from me from the champ. Now, me and the champ's going to have... Actually, look, I've got a gin and tonic. He's got a vodka and tonic. We're going to have a vodka and tonic, and we're going to have... I think we'll follow it with a light and bitter in a minute, won't we? Yeah. And a bowl of jelly deals, yeah? So remember, you youngsters out there, right? The jelly deals keep you strong. Yes, they, they do. Well, thanks I'm for tuning in. Great lover of... <laughs> the great lover of jelly deals and light and bitter and vodka and tonic <laughs> cheers thanks for tuning in next time king of the gypsies johnny frankham pleased to talk to you thank you well, 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 well.